welcome to Occupy Brooklyn TV. I'm Melanie Butler. And I'm Atik Zabinski. Here are today's top stories. Feminists rally for women's rights. Anti-fracking activists crash New York Governor Cuomo's policy conference. Residents of Chattanooga fight for low-income housing and against police repression. Harlem cop watcher Jazz Hayden faces trumped up weapons charges and tells us how he became a media activist. We join the fun at Occupy Town Square No. 9 in Sunset Park and talk with acclaimed author and Mideast expert Norman Finkelstein. On Sunday, August 26th, a day of action was held by a new feminist organization, Women Organized to Resist and Defend, or WORD. The event took place on Women's Equality Day and the planned eve of the Republican and Democratic National Conventions. Here in New York, Word began their rally outside the offices of Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, protesting sexism in media. The march then headed to Times Square for a speak out on reproductive rights, and then two blocks south to the NYPD and military recruitment stations. At the same time, a topless rally was held in Bryant Park with a march to Times Square. The rally was a statement against cultural standards that discourage New Yorkers from exercising their legal right to bare breasts in public. Again, during the 2012 election coverage, what percentage of those quoted by major media outlets were women? 19% of those quoted were women. That's unacceptable. Unacceptable. Not the church, not the state. Women must decide their fate. Not the church, not the state. I feel like our country seems to be going backwards in their decision making. I would like women to be able to make their medical decisions based on their needs and their family's needs and their doctor's needs. I don't think the government um, or one political party specifically should be making the decisions for everybody. Wherever we work, wherever we go, yes means yes and no means no. Yes, yes, and no means no. We are outside of free abortion alternatives. We are outside of free abortion alternatives. Not because we think it's wrong for a woman to choose adoption over abortion. Not because we think it's wrong for a woman to choose adoption over abortion. Not because we don't believe in making an informed decision. Not because we don't believe in making an informed decision. It is important to be well informed. It is important to be well informed. But that is not what this clinic has to offer. These same political forces, these same political forces are doing everything they can, are doing everything they can to smash local, state, and federal budgets. To smash local, state, and federal budgets for services like child care. For services like child care. Food stamps. Food stamps. With benefits. With benefits. And public housing. Our mothers fought hard. Our mothers fought hard. To get where we are now. To get where we are now. And we will not go back. And I'm here today and to I'm talk directly. Today. To talk directly. To talk directly. To this military recruitment center. Last year alone. Last year alone. Sexual assaults. Three thousand sexual assaults were reported. Were reported from women in the military. From women in the military against men in their units. Against men in their units. And that's only a percentage. And that's only a percentage of the actual sexual assaults. That doesn't even address. That doesn't even address the tens of millions of families. The tens of millions of families. Were displaced in Iraq, Afghanistan, and all over the world. And were displaced in Iraq, Afghanistan, and all over the world because of illegal U.S. intervention. We're here today, and we're here today to say that women's rights, to say that women's rights are people's rights, are people's rights from here, from here across the world, across the world. And how many more mothers will have to grieve the loss of a loved one at the hands of police brutality? more crimes of violence against women will the police turn a deaf ear to? But the reality is, it's the police act in the interest of the rich. They don't care about women's rights. They don't care about poor working people. On Wednesday, August 22nd, activists opposing the Spectra fracked gas pipeline targeted New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. 
350 protesters rallied outside the Sheridan Hotel in Manhattan, where Cuomo was hosting a policy conference. Inside the hotel ballroom, two protesters disguised as attendees briefly interrupted the conference. The couple dramatized fracking's contamination of water by performing a magic trick in which the man turned a glass of water green. The woman then drank the glass and collapsed as security removed the two. Governor Cuomo told reporters that the state has no timetable for legislation on fracking. As the governor plans his bid for the presidency in 2016, he is presenting himself as neutral in the increasingly heated and divisive fracking debate. I thought that was a really clever little inside action. I don't know if you could hear in the video the analogy water into wine, water into brine, and how she unfurled the banner that had all the chemicals that are used in fracking listed on it, the woman who was playing kind of the magician's assistant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first time I saw that video, I kind of wondered uh, who the audience was, because everyone in the room seemed to be making an effort to pretend that nothing was going on, just, just ignore them. So I, I wonder what the point was, but I guess th these sorts of actions just sh serve to show how serious people feel, how passionate people feel about fighting fracking, and that must make an impact on a politician who is thinking about election. Absolutely, and they did get very close uh, to him, just one table away. So I think they did really great to sneak in there. And that video is getting a lot of hits on YouTube. <laughs> there you go. Occupy Wall Street activists Amelia H.M. and Kathleen Russell have been on the road for over a month, documenting the struggles of activist movements across the country. This week, their radical resistance tour takes us to Chattanooga, Tennessee, where residents organizing to protect their homes are facing increasing police repression. Chattanooga's primarily African-American West Side neighborhood has been the target of a coordinated attack on low-income housing. In April, Mayor Ron Littlefield initiated plans to redevelop two of its last remaining public housing units. The plan was to be carried out by purpose-built communities, an Atlanta-based organization founded by Warren Buffett and Atlanta's biggest developer, Thomas Cousins. Uh, Roxanne had heard some things and she told us what they, their plans had been, that they had planned that they were going to tear down the housing and put in mixed income housing. What mixed income means, we don't know. That could be uh, upper middle class or rich people or not. We decided that we were going to say to the housing authority and to the city uh, that we wanted to keep our housing. And we went down to City Hall, spoke to the city fathers on what was happening to us out here. They claimed they didn't hear, they didn't know anything about Purpose Built. They didn't know that these people were coming down here, that they had been invited to come down and tear down public housing. We came back to our committee and we talked about what we thought that uh, we wanted the city and the housing authority to do. We got a petition. In a matter of, say, um, three weeks, we gathered up over 2,000 uh, signatures of people who said that they were for public housing. There were even people in the city who were saying that there is not enough housing even to rent, let alone to buy, but to rent, and that the rents were astronomically high and uh, that we wanted some kind of uh, cap put on it, at least for them to say if they tore down the housing, but they replaced it. They have been trying to run the people out of the public housing by getting the police to harass the people who live there. Uh, at night, even though there isn't a curfew in the city, uh, adults are not allowed, not even, uh, to sit on their porch without the police walking up on your porch and asking you for identification. Our children are harassed. Uh, some are hauled off to jail. They put the handcuffs on them so tight, they almost break their arms, pick them up and slam them to the ground, and then uh, throw them in jail. And then the mother has to go and pick them up. They call the ladies out of their names, disrespect them. To the kids, how can you respect a cop if he's gonna call your mother uh, uh, a name that, that I wouldn't say in the church right now. Then they use the N-word. Those kind of things should not happen. It's sad, but it happens almost every day. We have a community here. 
We know our neighbors. We know who they are. We look out for one another. Places you have neighborhood watch where people watch out for themselves in the community. But we're having a neighborhood watch, what we call a cop watch. We're trying to arm the people with some kind of justice. So we're asking them now, when you see this happening, make a date and a time when you see something happening. The lawyer, Uber, Joyce's lawyer said, it's important when you take the picture to write down the date, the, the, date the time that you took the picture. And the name of the officer. And the name of the officer or whatever. The badge number. Whatever the event. We have got to get our churches, our ministers together, our, uh, our, our uh, people who uh, have some knowledge of the system to work with us as well if the city is going to be this way. Uh, I hate to see it fall into tyranny, but that's what the tyranny is. And to say that the police are the terrorists, it seems that way in our neighborhood. To donate to Chattanooga Organized for Action or find out more, visit chataction.org. And for more stories of Americans fighting back, visit the Radical Resistance Tour at radicalresistancetour.tumblr.com. Joseph Jazz Hayden is a Harlem community activist now facing trumped-up weapons charges brought against him in retaliation for his cop watch work. He and his associates videotape the NYPD as they conduct stop and frisk and other unwarranted searches. The 70-year-old organizer of the Stop the New Jim Crow campaign and creator of the website allthingsharlem.com gave us the full story last week. Allthingsharlem.com, as you can see, uh, you know, we got over 400 videos up there. And we begin to cover everything in Harlem, you know, politics, education, housing, health care, and police community relationships. I was in the bar and somebody said, hey, police out there, they got somebody. You know, I rush out, you know, with my camera because I keep my camera on me. And I begin to start filming them. And uh, immediately they begin, uh, one of them begin uh, shining the flashlight in my camera. And I tell them, like I tell all the police, I'm here, I'm on your side. I'm here to watch you provide the community courtesy, professionalism, and respect. You know, isn't this what you want? Isn't this what you're going to do? This is what you advertise on the side of your car? So why are you trying to prevent me from filming this? It seems like this would be the thing that you would want me to do. You know, unless, of course, you're not providing courtesy, professionalism, and respect. You know? and they keep shining the lights, I say, okay, it's clear what you're about. <laughs> so anyhow, two months later, I'm driving down Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard, and a bar that I stopped at, we stopped at uh, Lorraine's when I was over here. I was headed there, and all of a sudden there's flashing lights. And I'm looking at these flashing lights, and I pull over, and who is it? These same two bullies, you know, come up to the car, yeah, yeah, we know you and uh, you know, step out of the car. I say, well, listen, you don't have my permission to search his car. You don't have my consent to search me. If you want to pat me down to make sure I don't have no weapon, if you're concerned about a weapon, you can do that. Don't stick your hands in my pocket. They say, all right, you know, go to the back of the car. So another two policemen take me to the back of the car, and uh, they immediately jumped in the car and went to search. <laughs> they indicated that they were charging me as a felony for this pocket knife that you can buy in any 99 cent store in the country, any hardware store in the country, you know, and, uh, and, and a miniature baseball bat, right? Uh, yeah, it'd be your know, memorabilia, you know, actually it's my wife's. Mm -hmm. So they charged me with two counts of uh, possession of a dangerous weapon, a dangerous weapon. You know, and I'm facing two to seven years on each count. Huh? I'm 71 years old, man. Yeah, well, there's a call to pack the court that day, but it's been packed the last two court appearances. This is eight months. I mean, the grand jury action should, should take no less than 30 days, take no more than 30 days. Eight months, you're sitting there trying to decide whether you're going to, you know, what are they looking for? Cy Vance, the district attorney of Manhattan, I literally, interviewed this guy. He came into my office when he was running for office and he spoke to me about uh, what he was going to do 
to uh, uh, you know bring fairness and, and, and equity to the office. You know, and then you you have seven hundred thousand stop and frisks in the city, and not one district attorney has stepped up and said, "Man, this is wrong." And nobody has stepped to the mayor. None of them have stepped to the mayor or the police commissioner Kelly and said, listen, man, don't bring these cases. These cases, man, uh, you violate these people's constitutional rights. I still continue to hold out hope, you know, for the district attorney because this is his opportunity to validate the promises that he made when he was running for office. Here's the chance for him to say, listen, in the interest of justice, this is absolute, you know, I have to dismiss this. No way I can prosecute this man, right? And so a petition has grown to over 1,600 signatures. Uh, letters have been flowing into the district attorney's office on a daily basis. They're the servants of the people, even though they've turned that relationship upside down. Now, when has the servant had any secrets from the master? <laughs> from the people that pay him, right, and make his life livable, you know, gives him the health benefits and make it able for him to send his kids to school. And we can't cover them, we can't videotape them, we can't record them. Get out of here, man. Come on, man. You know, if you don't like the job, go get another one, man. And you take half, uh, uh, one half of the working class and you have them regulate the other half of the, the, the working class, the unemployed. And, and potentially social dynamite half of the working class is controlled. Same thing in the prisons. You know, you take the rural communities and the urban communities, you make one to keep or you make one to keep, right? Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the military. You know, you got people over, overseas that, that are opposing U.S. policy. You know, we send our young men over there and turn them into serial killers. Uh, on a national level, we're building this national security state Every day there's new regulation, right? They started out with the DNA uh, thing for sex offenders, then violent felony offenders, then all felony offenders, and now they got all felony and misdemeanor offenders. You know, pretty soon all they got to do is walk in the Harlem Hospital, man, and just start DNA in the babies, you know, because that's what it's coming down to, mm -hmm. you know. A new campaign against the NYPD's stop and frisk policy is set to launch on Thursday, September 13th. The campaign is called Blow the Whistle on Stop and Frisk. Its plan is to arm communities under attack with 10,000 whistles. Residents are to blow the whistles whenever they see illegal police behavior, thereby alerting their communities to witness and document the police. For more information, visit indiegogo.com slash blow the whistle. Carl Dix, September 13th, I'm going to be blowing the whistle on stop and frisk, and you need to be with us doing it too. You knew a whistle could stop someone from being hurt, from being killed. By blowing this whistle in the community and letting everybody know that when you see something going on, when you see the police doing something that they should not be doing, or somebody's doing something to you, blow this whistle. All of your neighbors will come out, they'll start looking, and they'll start seeing what the police are doing. And make sure you donate. It can save a life. On Saturday, August 26th, Occupy had its ninth Occupy Town Square. These events are like miniature occupations in which the movement gathers at a public park for a day of community outreach. Every Occupy Town Square takes place in a different neighborhood, and this past Saturday's was in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. The seven-hour event included workshops and teach-ins on subjects such as immigrant rights, anarchism, cop watch, and the Young Lords Party. There were kids' events and music and theater performances by groups such as Theater for the New City. We stopped to talk with members of the street theater troupe about their work. This play has to do with Chino Garcia, who was one of the founders of a cultural center on the Lower East Side called Chavez that got sold by Mayor Giuliani. The guy who bought it was never able to develop it and because the neighborhood would not, not allow it. And so we are fighting to this day to bring this building back to the people. There were well over 500 people here. So we're very pleased with that. We do get big audiences. Uh, we have a little stage. It's only um, 
24 by 16. Um, and we have a large company, it's a 50 person company, and we have a, a live band of five musicians. And their voices are beautiful. We have a combination of professional actor, singer, dancers with amateur singer, dancer, actors. And we have plenty of room for new people every year, but some people have been with me for 15 or 20 years. We're proud of our connection to Occupy, and the last song says that we stand with them, and that this fight is not over. And of course it's not over, it's just begun. I was very late for it, but I was glad I went. And yeah. I'm, I always appreciate Occupy Town Square. Besides the fact that it's a lot of fun, I think it's actually one of the most important things Occupy does. Mm -hmm. Because our biggest problem is most people just don't know where to find us. Yeah. And I've always felt it's a big problem that Occupy was so centered in the financial district of, of Manhattan when it really needs to spread everywhere. So for Occupy to actually come to our neighborhoods, come to our parks, and engage with the local communities is the, just the best thing we can be doing. Absolutely, and we've found so many new, vibrant communities that way. People have just been really m much more involved at the local level in some areas. And Sunset Park is a great example of that because of the rent strike and Occupy Sunset Park has been so strong there. I really like the multilingual uh, reach, outreach that we did there with the multilingual flyers, the bilingual uh, mic checks and general yeah. assemblies. Yeah, I saw some beautiful multilingual banners and you know it seemed like there was lots of children and just a lot of diversity of age groups and different communities coming together. People were into that Young Lords workshop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well stay tuned for the next one of those. Norman Finkelstein is a highly acclaimed and controversial political scientist, activist, and author. His primary works have focused on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the politics of the Holocaust. We spoke with him at his apartment, where he shared his thoughts on Gandhi and the Occupy movement. For Gandhi, the challenge was not to bring enlightenment about injustice in the world. People already know the injustices. The problem is getting them to act on what they already know is wrong. And the purpose of politics, in particular non-violent civil disobedience for Gandhi, was that it was supposed to act as a stimulant uh, to goad people, goad the uh, indignant but still passive bystanders, to goad them into action to get them to do something about what they already know is wrong. And in that respect, the Occupy movement was, in my ways, almost the quintessence of what Gandhi had in mind. First of all, the slogan that captioned, the captured the imagination of masses of people, uh, we are the 99%. Uh, well, you didn't have to enlighten people about the injustices of the capitalist system, even though they didn't call it the capitalist system, but you didn't have to enlighten them about the injustices of the system. Uh, there was a, a, a very widespread, a pervasive opinion, especially in the last 10 years, that there's something profoundly wrong with this system, that there's a handful of people who are raking in lots and lots of money, and then there are masses of people who are um, uh, not only not doing well, but doing worse than ever before. Pivotal moment for the civil rights movement, especially for young black people around the country, was the scenes for, say, in, say, the uh, Woolworths stores where people are sitting at the lunch counters and are getting beaten by the white racists. And a lot of pe young black people saw those scenes and they said, you know, I've been saying the same thing as these people 
Now, it's time to go beyond talk the talk and walk the walk. I belong there with them. And I'm living in Brooklyn, New York, and I hear about the Occupy Wall Street, and these young folks are sitting in this place called Zucchini Park or something. I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. Uh, uh, so I'm thinking to myself, well, that's terrific, but, you know, I'm heading towards 60. Uh, what's my Woodstock days are behind me. I'm not going to go camping out anywhere at this point in my life. It's unseemly for me at my age, and it'll be embarrassing for the young people uh, on their side. Uh, but then I hear this thing about this mass arrest of 800 people at the Brooklyn Bridge. And I'm thinking to myself, now wait a minute, Norm. This is the Brooklyn Bridge, 800 people are getting arrested and you're doing nothing? No, it's time to walk the walk. Enough talk the talk. That's our show for today. Thanks so much for watching. But don't wait till next week. If you're one of the 99%, we want to hear from you. Get involved by contacting the email address or the phone number on your screen. Tell us what you think of the show, what you'd like us to do different, how you'd like to help out. We want to hear from you. This occupation needs your participation. Get in touch.